Watch that mic. Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, and you kind of stole my theme there. Oh, I, I want to. I'm, I'm not going to read too much. We're going to talk mostly, but I think I should read the legal note to the nudist on the late shift because this uh, this conveys really the kind of way I write and the way I write about people. Legal note. There are some people in this book who asked that their names be changed. They and their reasons for seeking pseudonymity are as follows. The individual identified here as Michael Zilly was freely open and on the record about his unusual manner of funding his startup venture, growing marijuana and selling it wholesale, until he got a job with a respectable corporation and did not want his background to catch up to him. In a similar dynamic, the individual identified here as John slash David Foster retroactively requested a pseudonym for himself and his employer only when the latter ran into unexpected financial difficulty. In exchange for pseudonymity, the Oracle salesperson identified as Mars Garo allowed me to pose as his assistant while we made his rounds without requesting permission from his superiors. The individual identified as Claudia Gomez asked for a pseudonym since lying about one's identity in order to, to trick receptionists into giving out employee names might be viewed as fraudulent behavior. The individual identified as B, who had developed an intricate plan to murder one of his coworkers, asked that I not use his name for obvious reasons. <laughs> the, um, yeah, I, I, I came out of college in the mid 80s and I read what was to be, you come out and, and everybody was focused on what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do with your life? And, and what you, it seemed that we didn't even know, I didn't even know who I was. Like how can I tell you what I'm gonna do when I didn't know who I was? And there was this emerging phenomenon of this idea that you're gonna try to find yourself through your work, that, that you're not gonna check your personality at the door when you come into work in the morning, that work would become itself almost like a, a self-empowerment movement at the same time, that these, in, this incredible ambition for the job, that, that you, would, you would not only bring home a paycheck, that you'd bring home a better self in the end, or, or a happier person, uh, really hadn't but thrust upon the idea of work, and started really sort of emerge in, you know, slowly over time in the course of our history, but really come upon us now. And I was just always fascinated with that question that, you know, the search for the self in most people's sort of real life takes place upon what job am I going to take? What job am I going to take? And well, you took a job as a bond salesman, didn't you? Well, it After. took me a while to get there. I, uh, I went and I came out of college in 1986. I went to Manhattan to write a novel. And I sat down to write on a friend's couch and started writing in notebooks. And uh, everybody who had moved to New York that summer started to work in investment banking. This was the thing. This was the rage. I didn't understand it. But here I was writing about, I'd studied studio art when I was in college at Stanford uh, and economics. And uh, I was going to write a novel about uh, some art, an art historian and an artist or something, and it was set in Soho. And boy, was I out of it. I mean, all these people who were my age were wearing suits, and they were marching across town, and they were going to parties, and I had no money. I couldn't, I couldn't afford to go. I saw one movie that summer that I didn't have, and I couldn't even go to a bar, you know. And New York is not fun if you don't have any money no. kind of thing. And so I realized something was going on, like I was missing it. And if I wanted to, even to write about what was going on with my generation or to stay in touch with, with that, and maybe even for myself to learn from it, I'd better do this thing and b b get a suit and go work downtown in some big building. And it, you know, it was scary. I thought it would be a big prison those big buildings look like it to me. And I went and got a job as a litigation consultant at a company. <laughs> I was defending PG&E's Diablo Canyon nuclear reactor construction costs. <laughs> and I was in the back of this room. And I was wearing a suit, and I was being paid $31,000 a year, which was a tremendous amount of money back then. And I was just a guy just out of college. And it was enough for me to make my student loans, you know, and uh, have an apartment in town. But there was this just this lie going on. We were marching downtown, like, yeah, the young executives, and we were in this windowless room, 12 of us. And my job, 60 hours a week, was to add up numbers that the computer had already added up to make sure the computer hadn't made a rounding error. And we were being billed out to PG&E 
at the rate of $120 an hour. We were being paid something like $12 an hour. And PG&E was billing you for my services. And I was like, I, I was going crazy. So I was so depressed. One day I went down to the YMCA at the Barcadero. And I would go down there every day at lunch and kind of work out. And so the, this was in San Francisco? In San Francisco, mm -hmm. yeah. And at the YMCA, people was, they would go down to the pool. And I'd swim at the pool. They would step onto the scale and they'd weigh themselves. And I finally one day I stepped onto the scale to weigh myself. And I just kept tapping the thing and tapping it back. And I was like, what's happened to me? I'm like withering away. I had, without even knowing it, lost 17 pounds. I was down mm -hmm. to 137 pounds. And I weigh, I weigh about 175 now or something like that. Mm -hmm. So imagine me 40 pounds lighter than I am Ooh. right now. And I was like, I was literally withering away on the job. And I realized something was going on. And I had to do something about it. So I had this dream of creating, of, of greeting cards. So I started to draw greeting cards. I had an art background. And next thing you know, I, for the 12 people in the room, I raised stock from them. And they all bought into my company. <laughs> and they were like my army. So the executives would come by, and they, would, they all looked like they're working away. And I was working my national sales reps out of the back of this office. Oh, and I'm pretending to tap away on a 10 key. And I started this greeting card company, and I quit. And I thought, this is just it's bread and butter now. It's just going to pay the bills. I'm set for life, because the sales went like this. It took off. And, and you still wanted to write your novel. Oh, yeah. And I, was, yeah, and I wanted to write another novel. And, and, but immediately, the sales fell out of the floor. Because I didn't know a thing about being an entrepreneur. I didn't know a thing about managing sales reps. And I printed the cards on the wrong kind of stock. And it was, life was suddenly bad. And, and I panicked. And I said, I, I need a job somewhere. And I fl gave a friend a resume. And it was at an investment banking firm. And they had me in the next day. And I got a job the next morning. And there I was, a bond salesman with a billion dollars running through my hands every day. I was trading overnights and short-term securities. I, would trade a I was 22 years old, and a billion dollars would literally go through my hands. I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, so now I look down in Silicon Valley, and you meet a billionaire, and you think, you know, I was like, God, that was just a day's work for me. <laughs> you know? so. Well, you've said that you, you have this ability not to care about money, and that that makes people who have money not be weird around you. Yeah. And that helped you in being able to research this book and the other books that you've written as well. So where do you think you get that? Is that from your investment, investment banking stint, or do you think that was part of you from before? Oh, that's a really good question. I, you're describing this phenomenon that, that people down in the valley, they like having me around, that, that a lot of other reporters come in, and all the reporters can just see the money. You know, they, and they don't see the real person there. They just see the this billion dollar bill floating above your head. And, and I come in and I just like see the person and I, I can be able to look past the money. And I think that a lifetime of having sort of like that experience as an investment banker was a factor. But I think it goes way back. Um, to your me- Your father was an entrepreneur. Yeah, my father was an original entrepreneur back in the 80s what it meant to be an entrepreneur, or late, late 70s really, was not to start your own business. It was for a white collar person to leave the white collar world and buy a blue collar business and run it better than it had been run before and make money that way. So a bunch of my dad's friends were doing that in the late 70s. They were all divorced guys, you know, and this was sort of a recapture of their youth. And one guy bought a, uh, a, a steel boiler company. Mm -hmm. And my dad bought out of bankruptcy a company to refurbish the rotary dial housings on rotary dial telephones, to take the plastic off and buff it up again. And back then, you know, we didn't have push button phones, we just had rotary dial phones. And my dad knew that AT&T was in this lawsuit to be broken up by this monopoly. But he thought, yeah, but even if they break up AT&T, we'll still have phones. I mean, we're always gonna need these rotary dial phones. We're never gonna not need a phone. So he was sure that this was a good business to buy out of bankruptcy. And for the first year and before AT&T got broken up, it was a great business. And he was making money. And being an entrepreneur was cool. And then AT&T was broken up. And nobody wanted rotary dial telephones anymore. And he had this business going down the tubes. And so all during my high school, it, uh, we lived in a situation where it was really tough to get by, and you had to be careful when you're answering the phone at night because you might be a creditor who's going to, you know, trying to get money from you. And we had to go pay the phone bills in cash because we couldn't go down any checks and that kind of thing. And 
to me then, that was when I learned that the world of work wasn't just this sort of man in a gray flannel suit, this sort of boring world, that you know, my dad had a safe house where he stored his cash, you know, and he was an entrepreneur. It was a very sort of, it was a Raymond Chandler novel. You know, was to, to be an entrepreneur. And I learned that it was very dramatic life. And, you know, the years was incredibly under a tremendous pressure and taking out his anger on the family. Mm -hmm. um, those all were, were big factors. But I was even younger before that, right? So I remember when I was in eighth grade, I worked at the Millstone Restaurant in Seattle, and I was a busboy. And I got promoted to be assistant manager. And the owner of the Millstone restaurant, most of his employees were, san these people who made sandwiches and stuff, were like Harvard grads that had come out to be actors in Seattle during the summer. And to be you know, a, a Harvard grad who's an actor making $2.35 an hour was extremely humiliating. So payday <laughs> was a very humiliating experience. And so he would hand out the paychecks and people resented him for those paychecks. You know, That was f the day that people quit. Like they got their paycheck and they're like, I can't believe this is all I'm making, and they would quit. So one day he was like not around. He told me to hand out the paychecks, and nobody quit. And I had this thing that I would hand out the paychecks, and people wouldn't get mad. Wow. And it was like I had this aura, like people didn't go weird around the money. So I became the guy who handled the money. I was in eighth grade, and I was the money guy <laughs> for this restaurant. And everybody else was you know, at least twice my age. I mean, I was 14. And I was handling the books for this this big downtown restaurant kind of so thing. So, what do you think that was? Is it was it? Did you not care about the money even then? Yeah, I guess so. Or you think it's just something that emanates from you? Um, well, first of all, it's extremely facile with numbers. Uh, I have a just I, when I was in high school, I had a math whiz, and I was third in the state in the Washington State math championships one year. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had no idea that I had that. But one day we were down at the basketball gym, and this guy says, come take this test. And I didn't know what it was. I'm like, oh, I'm shooting baskets. What are you talking about? So come take this test. So it was some sort of like Caltech uh, entrance exam thing. And your average score for students is like a 40 out of 100. And the highest score had been posted by someone who got a 77 one year or something. And our teacher would regularly get like a 70 or something. And, but I didn't know that. I just wanted to take this test. And it was the hardest test I'd ever taken. I'm used to getting 100 out of 100 on math tests. And I feel like I can only get about 2 thirds right. And uh, the next day they said, you know, you got the highest score in two years or something. I was like, what are you talking about? Well, I know. So I went off to the math championship. So I think that money just doesn't make me uncomfortable with the digits, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, that sounds fair. Right. But what happens when you go down to the valley? And you said, as you said, when you're with other, when you're around other reporters. The other reporters don't get the same reception that you get. Well, so, and some you've do, also yeah. turned down a great many jobs and opportunities that yeah. would have made you a great deal of money, um, seeing as how you've been in the valley for so long. You've, you, you just rub it in, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> would you like a Kleenex? Um, <clears throat> I guess what I'm saying is I, I find this to be very admirable um, mm. that because I also live in the valley myself and I see this tremendous you know, money being the measure of success um, yeah. and many times wish that there was something else that was the measure of success. You know, Maybe our heads would grow as more successful we became and, and so we would care more about how big our heads were rather than right. how much money we had. Um, just thinking about it in terms of, not in terms of buying things, but in terms of, of a feeling of success. Yeah. So you obviously have that because you've turned all of these opportunities down and you, you've decided to follow your career as a writer. Um, where do you get that? Uh, I've been offered a lot of these jobs lately. I mean, I think that particularly lately I've, I've reached this sort of critical mass point where I'm going to write about things and I know a lot more than the pe about the business than the people I'm writing about. Mm -hmm. Not only I mean, I know who to call to get that done that they're having trouble getting done, and and I have strategy ideas for their internet business, and I can translate. I remember I was the recent job offer. I was hanging out at this startup, and this program was supposed to interview this uh, community guy who's a big content specialist. You know, doesn't know a thing about programming, and the two couldn't talk to each other. 
you. But I was like, let me try to tell you what he's saying, and let me try to interpret his answer for you. And they understood, and I was like, wow, you know, you should be managing this place. You know, don't you want a job? You'll be the first VP we'll hire, and we'll give you, you know, two and a half percent equity in the company or something. And I'm like, well, I can't do that because I'm writing about you. That's a conflict of interest. But I, there's also that part of it that the stories that I most love, the people that I most love, I would like to work with are the ones that I choose to write about. Mm -hmm. And then I, I can't deal to myself. I can't write about things that I would take an interest in. So what it comes down to is that the writing really is more important to you than anything else. Yeah, the writing. I mean, you know, when I'm happiest, I write in, when I, when I do my serious writing, I have this closet. And it's about three feet wide by four feet deep by about five feet tall. It's dark in there. It's just me and my laptop. And I'll put the headphones on, and I'll put one song on, and I'll play the same song repeatedly all day long. And people think, why are you torching yourself for your writing? Why are you making these like sacrifices, these hum like, pulling all-nighters for your writing and punishing yourself? And I'm like, no, that's I'm, I'm blocking out the rest of the world for a moment because there's nothing that makes me happier and gets me more jazzed than to find the right words for a thought, to be able to, to express thoughts and feelings and f in, in the right way, you know, to work on a sentence to the point that it actually says, you know, what you feel. Um, I'm, one of my crucial moments in my sort of development as a writer, my grandmother, who lives in Seattle, had flown into San Francisco and she was, uh, she was dating a guy who had once run the Westin St. Francis Hotel, and they were staying in some suite down there, and I was like, wow, it's just fancy. And, <laughs> and went in there, and I mailed her a couple of my stories recently. This was 10 years ago. And, and she said, I said, what did you think of those stories? She said, well, you're a lot more interesting in person than you come across in your writing. And I was like, oh, you know, boy. Oh. No. I mean that was but what I mean what great advice is to get all yourself on the page. That's true. And when you can actually be all on the page, you know, your sense of humor, your sense of drama, your sense of excitement about your love of people, um, and your soul. Ideally you get your soul on the page too, then writing is not suffering. You know, writing in writer's block so often my experience as a publisher and working with other writers comes from not putting all of yourself on the page and attempting to just write from a small sort of pie piece. And um, so nothing makes me happier than, than to write. That's when I just, just like, gosh, I feel confident, I like myself, mm -hmm. and I can't, I can't replace that with anything. Did you, as a child, know that you wanted to write? Or, I mean, all writers, I think, are keen observers. And you, of course, are very keen at observing. I, I know that there were many things in my childhood that I observed about people, especially nuances in people's character, yeah. um, and <clears throat> the little things that other people wouldn't bother with or wouldn't care to think about, or reworking dialogue and s imagining scenes. Do you remember that from childhood, or do you, do you think that as a child you knew you wanted to write, or did you, did you learn that later when you, when you grew older? I love to make haunted houses. I mean, you talk about real, you know, real childhood experiences. I was just Mr. Haunted House all the time, you know, just constantly working on it. <laughs> and in around fifth grade, our friends said, let's write some horror stories. So I had some tremendous fun for a couple of years writing little horror stories. Great. And that was great. That was sort of taking that haunted house experience. I liked to work with my hands, and I liked that kind of craft. And I just didn't make, and so I think I, even then I thought, you know, I loved this. I thought, well, writing is cool. I didn't make the transition to books without pictures very well at all. So I kind of stopped reading in eighth grade <laughs> until I was about 24. Oh, don't tell my son that, please. <laughs> it's, not a, it's, not, it's not a really, I mean, uh, you know, sophomore year in high school, they assign Grapes of Wrath, and I'm like, just go get the movie and the Cliff Notes and <laughs> forget it, you know. I did read The Great Gatsby, and I read The Stranger. And so then I started dreaming of being a writer, and I liked to write, but reading was something that was very hard for me to find the love again because you go to class and you know great gatsby it's you know tom and daisy and gatsby and love and this thing and my teacher's talking about green and the end of the dock symbolizing money and i'm like what about 
you know, the passions in the heart, and no one would talk about that in class. And they would write about, talk about them the way English would do, but never the way people would write about them or really who read them. So the, the love of reading just got drilled out of me, and it wasn't until I didn't take a single English class during college. You and majored in economics. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to take writing classes, but you had to sleep overnight outside the writing department and to get, get it. into the class unless you were in the major. Um, I was studying economics, and I learned, I wrote four honors theses, and I was like, wow, I love to write. You know, I didn't know this. No one had ever written four honors theses, four, you know, 80-page <laughs> undergraduate papers or something, and I was like, I like, oh, I like to write, you know, but I wasn't reading any books, so right before I graduated from college, I read like three or four books, and I was like, oh, books aren't so bad anymore, but what I had done is when I was studying studio art, and through that, I kind of hit a wall with studio arts, and I found that I liked to draw, but beyond that, I couldn't do it very well. So I started to illustrate children's books, mm -hmm. and I loved that, and through that I started reading young adult literature, and I really started reading for pleasure again when I was about, when I was an investment banker, and I started reading for pleasure again for the first time, adult literature. As an escape, in a way? Yeah, as a try to escape. <laughs> I wrote a novel while I was an investment banker, mm -hmm. and I thought I was just, you know, it's just the entire opposite of investment banking. It was it was a, like a young adult novel, sort of a cross between Watership Down and Animal Great Farm, now. and it was about these animals in this Colorado forest. And I did all this research on what the wildlife was like. And Sounds like an investment banking firm. <laughs> well, yeah. So I wrote this whole novel, and I didn't know who to give it to. So I gave it to a friend at work, and he read it, and he said, "This is the best book about investment banking I've ever oh, read." No. You know. And like the main characters are like a beaver and stuff like that, and, you know. It's like, so I did, had no idea that I really was writing about that world without doing it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't it didn't occur to me to write about investment banking until I went to the writing program at San Francisco State. Mm -hmm. And when I was in investment banking, I was I started in that world. I was 22, and after two year and a half, they were like, "Listen, you're really good at this. You ought to." commit to doing this as a career, and if you do, we'll start you out at $300,000 a year salary. And wow. plus, and you'll probably make twice that with all your commissions and that kind of thing. And I was like, no, I'm gonna go to the writing school at San Francisco State. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's really a calling. That's really nice. Yeah, to and uh, when I was out there, I was out there writing stories for years, and they tell you write about what you know. That's and right. one day, after years, I just said, you know, I I I feel jealous of other writers. They've they've traveled around the world, or they come from these interesting experiences. I don't know anything except for what it's like to haul my butt down to work every day. And so sometimes I said, well, I'll write about that. That's and I started to write about that experience. It's like, wow. I mean, I suddenly had so much to say. And my writing wasn't just like some piddly little story. It was like infused with meaning and commentary and the, like a tone of an essay. And my humor came out. And I was suddenly writing about I realized I knew a whole lot about this experience of trying to you know, channel your whole self through that sort of narrow pipe of your job and the agony of that experience and trying to find you know, work that is truly meaningful in life mm -hmm. and how you evolve to do that. And I had been through that. I had... I had I had a greeting card company. I worked in litigation, consultant, investment. I taught at Mission High School for a year here, um, as a as a as I was getting a teaching credential. Um, I had a newsletter on San Francisco politics. I was trying everything. I worked at a small pub book publishing company, you know, looking for We're gathering material. I think. Yeah, I was looking for you know. I I really wanted to be a writer, but who you couldn't. It was I wouldn't let myself really believe that it would ever happen. Um, you go down to the valley or when you are doing your research how do you get people to talk to you like people who are growing marijuana to fund their startup <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, I listen I think that's just it's just that simple uh, I love people's stories I love them to wash over me and the hardest thing for me is to take the time to weed through 19 entrepreneurs who have got some uninteresting idea that they think is somehow great, and to have the persistence to keep looking for the gems that are really inspiring, and or really human. I mean, looking for really human stories. And 
when I find them, <clears throat> it's never been a problem to get them to talk to me. And I think mostly because they hear, they see me listening, they hear me listening. They like talking, people like talking about what they do. And they feel great passion for what they're doing. They find it to be very exciting and very dramatic. Yesterday we were, we were at the, taking a camera around for the Jim Lehrer News Hour around up Silicon Valley. And we were down at this startup in Fremont. And boy, it couldn't have been a more boring locale. I mean, there was a couple of Porsches and Ferraris in the parking lot, but it was just a sea of cubicles in this one-story tilt-up building, most anonymous, low-slung office park you could find. And this guy I had introduced the correspondent to was saying, boy, it's so exciting. And the correspondent was like, what are you talking about? I mean, you're sitting here in a cubicle. You spend 100 hours a week in a cubicle inside this incredibly boring building. What is so exciting about it? And he was stumped. He, he didn't know how to answer. He's like, oh, well, it's, you know, but I really like to type these things in and think. And I had to intervene, and I said, listen, it's, it's just a job, but it's exciting because you have no idea what the outcome is going to be. In 12 weeks, this company could be three times its size or it could be totally disappear. The entire stock market and the entire financing system for the whole thing could vanish, could crash the next 12 weeks. The incredible uncertainty, it takes an ordinary job. You put it all on the line, take an ordinary job, and you, and you say, no salary, no salary, no security, all risk, and it becomes sort of heart beating for the people who go through it. And th that's, I think that's exciting that, you know, for my generation to come into the world of work, and particularly people who are sort of right behind me, they looked at the workplace as a place that they were going to have to sell their soul to be a part of, and a lot of people were just saying no. And we got this sort of moniker for our generation called slackers, and people would say, you know, we just don't want to join the working world. We don't want to enlist. We're not going to be part of the rank and file. And so we'll just hang out or be waiters or work at a cafe or something. And it's been really fascinating to watch those same people in Silicon Valley actually find work really exciting because it's kind of twisted, but if you don't guarantee the money up front, you're not selling out. You know, if you, you know, there's a, tons of people making millions of dollars down there at Yahoo, you know, it's something like 600 out of 1,000 people are, are, are millionaires. And at Hotmail, where I followed the story of Sabir Bhatia, he, when they sold their company to Microsoft, they had about 80 employees. Over half were millionaires. A lot of millionaires down there. But when they started, they didn't know anything. They were a completely unknown product. No one knew if it would succeed. And that's what makes it exciting for them. What about for you? What do you think about the Valley? I mean, generally, you're an optimist um, from what I've read in your books, and you, you have a great deal of empathy, uh, which I think is, is the mark of a good writer. And you, but you still are very clear about the good things and the bad things, well, the bad things that, that have come out of this, or, the, or the, the changes that have happened because of this gold rush that's going on in the valley. So generally, do you feel that these people that you followed around for nudist on, on, the, on the late shift um, are happy people? Uh, do you think that they're, uh, and people like them are heading in the direction of um, a good place, uh, this different kind of culture that you talk about? Mm, yeah. Um, or not happy it people. Sinister? No. no, but and no ambition to be happy, meaning, I think it's some, some famous poet, I don't know, it was maybe Coleridge or something, said that happiness is a dog sunning itself on a rock. <laughs> That's happiness, a dog sunning itself on a rock. People in Silicon Valley, the people that I write about, they're not interested in sunning themselves on a rock. They're interested in leading great lives. They're interested in, in experiencing extraordinary things. They're interested in you know, making a lot of money fast and then and living lives of great uncertainty and risk. And at each choice in life, between the path of more security and the path of greater risk, they would take the path of greater risk. Now, that's not all the valley overall, but that's the people that I, I would find ins inspiring and write about in the book. Do you oh. think this is a generational thing? 
um, that crosses out of, crosses over from Silicon Valley to, or is crossing over to other parts of the country, or yeah. do you think it's I just found my optimism thing? in that way, that after writing Bombardiers, which was, I think Business Week described it as uh, the most scathing portrait of Wall Street ever to see print. And uh, even though I liked the characters, you know, or something like that, they said, and I, I loved the people in that world, but the system was crazy, and the system drove people nuts. And what we would do in investment banking, basically, was take a table and buy the table and sell off the legs and the tabletop separately for more than we bought the table for. And then we'd go out into the market and buy a bunch of legs and tabletops and put them together as, as tables and sell the table for more than the parts. It was just one day in and one day out like that. And that's what would make money. We never built anything. We never added anything to the world. You know, market liquidity or something like that. All those brains, people coming out of these great schools who had, were really bright people who worked there were wasting themselves and the, not contributing to the productive economy. And we were paying them outrageous sums of money to do this. And that's what they wanted to do to me. They wanted to pay me you know, $300,000 to add nothing to the world. And I couldn't do that. And I so maybe in comparison, I see, yeah, there's a lot of rich people in Silicon Valley, but they are building things. Mm -hmm. And they are constructing things. And you could argue whether or not what they're building really adds value or not. You know, is the ability to trade Furbies on eBay really a great cultural renaissance <laughs> or not? But the way that I found my inspiration was seeing that people were moving here from all over the world and all over the country. So I said, well, listen, that's the project. In the tradition of Upton Sinclair and John Steinbeck and Joan Didion, I'm going to record the lives of those people. And so I found people, I followed 23 people from the day, nearly the day they moved here to follow them for up to three years to see how they fared because this, there was this dream being held out to people all over the world. I met yesterday, yesterday alone, a couple from Sweden who had come here, a couple from France who had come here, a woman from Santa Barbara who had moved up here, and people were coming in in, in droves. And they're coming on the basis of this dream. And I wanted to say, is that dream real? Or is it just an illusion? And you think about you know, Upton Sinclair's work or John Steinbeck's work, and the, the sort of genetic imprint for me as a serious writer is to record that cold truth of fate and to show that, in fact, you know, this is a vague and hollow promise. Because it has always been a vague and hollow promise before. And if you were an Oki and you came out here during the Depression, you know, life was just as tough out here. And there was no golden heyday for you, and no promised land. And so that was the instinct that I came to this project with. And I was going to record that. But I, f I couldn't help it. Uh, the optimism won, won me over. When I watched this guy, David Foster, who's 28 years old, he's on his fifth startup. And four have failed. But his fifth one is succeeding. The people who have failed here are not our downtrodden. They are willing to pick themselves up and do it again. And so the sort of the conventional paradigm by which we look at sort of success and failure was not the same. And to watch a young guy like Ben Chu move here from Taiwan and not know a soul and have his venture cap his business plan rejected by every venture capitalist on Sand Hill Road and then nevertheless not to give up the hope and to put in, yes, the 80, 90 hour weeks, but then to sell his company then sales coming for outrageous figure, nearly $50 million. I mean, uh, no other time in no other place could that happen. Could an immigrant to this country succeed in that manner? And you've written a lot about Iranian-American affairs. And I have many Iranian friends who have come here whose father you know, was very successful before the revolution in Iran and came here to be a bagger at Safeway because that was all that they could do. But their sons have grown up to start companies and succeed and, and be millionaires. And this is an incredibly special time. And to actually witness that firsthand with many, many people that I wrote about, to watch them succeed, no matter how jaded I was to start, I just that serious intellectual gene in me that wants me to say, oh, it's all a lie. Mm -hmm. you know, Dreams don't really come true. Well, for some, they have been. And I can't lie about that. 
So I've been turned into this kind of very careful optimist, but an optimist nonetheless. Well, I think it's, it's great. It, it really came through in the book, and, and I appreciated it, because living in the valley, when you go outside the valley, you hear um, many people sort of demean the valley, and, and you know, because of, of how well it's doing, in the same way that we used to look at investment bankers in yeah. the 80s. And so it's nice, it's nice to see that um, you've shown that people have worked very hard to get where they've gotten, uh, even, even on the road to getting there, right. perhaps they've not gotten there. It's very weird to see, though, someone sell their company for $50 million. Because you're like, at that point, you're like, boy, it'd just be great if he could just sell his company, the deal would come through, you know, like for a million or something. Mm -hmm. And then it would all pay off. But $50 million, like, mm -hmm. does anybody deserve that? And that's when it becomes twisted. You know, you spend, and, <laughs> and that's what's hard. And in the medium, you know, in relative prices and all that kind of thing, we could mm -hmm. go into that forever. But it, that, there's always some funny wrinkle to it. You know, it would just be a great Hiroshi, Hiroshio Alger story if he sold his company for a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Selling it for fifty million is like, there's a twist. There's something very modern and very ironic, always embedded in whatever happens in the valley. Mm -hmm. In the nudist on the late shift, um, you have several chapters. Of course, you go through the different kinds of people that you um, that you followed in the last three in the three years. You have the newcomers who are some of the people you met who had just arrived here and what their hopes and aspirations are. Then you follow an IPO. Uh, then you have a chapter about the entrepreneur, then the programmers, then the salespeople, uh, the futurist, and finally the dropout. How do you, are there, are you, were any of these more interesting to you than others or did you admire any of them more or which, which one of these kinds of people um, were you more interested in? As people, mm -hmm. I, was, I was drawn to more than anything to, to, to two kinds of people. Mm -hmm. One was the pilgrims, the people who had picked up their life and put it all on the line. You know, yesterday, I was down at the uh, first annual August Capital, which is a Sand, Sand Hill Road venture capitalist party. And I have an open party. And I was taking the, the Jim Lehrer News Hour camera there. And you look around, and it's like, this is not the, these are none of them are geeks, you know. I mean, this is people, they look good, they're young, they have a high energy, they have a steady eye, a firm handshake, you know, their khakis are pressed, you know, their shoes shine. <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, they've come with good pedigrees, they come from good business schools, and I, I still get along with those people, but those aren't the kind of people that I'm drawn to. I'm much more interested in people like the Ben Chews who put it all on the line and have don't, don't know people and don't have everything going for them. And I'm just really drawn to that, so much at stake in their life. And then the other people that I'm drawn to, and I give a few in the book, are ones that who could be anywhere in the world right now and have actually tried being anywhere in the world and come here by choice because they find it exciting. I think of someone like Steve Sellers, who before he came to Silicon Valley, he was counting tanks in the Sinai's for to help reinforce peace accord, flying around helicopters. Or his business partner, John Hankey, who was a press officer in Burma during the time that the students were rioting and the police were clash, cash, clashing down on the students. and. Uh, another guy, Greg Slayton, mm -hmm. who used to do airdrops into Africa and do and do microdevelopment lending, and does a, still very involved with a lot of microdevelopment lending around the world. And these are people who've had an instinct for adventure and had an instinct for a very worldly pursuit. And that people who are that worldly would be here says something about what the valley is up to these days. Mm -hmm that it isn't just people who sort of don't have a life and order Domino's pizza anymore. Something radically changed when we shifted from, Silicon Valley has had these sort of three incarnations, a hardware incarnation, mm -hmm. a software incarnation, and this internet incarnation. And people down there couldn't quite figure out where to go. It was 
about four or five years ago, the ideas were getting incredibly complicated. You had to have a PhD in double E to understand these things. 64-bit chipsets and massively parallel processing and fiber optic routing. And who knew what these things were? And it was getting out of hand. So our culture at that period of time, we would focus on things like when President Clinton came to town the first time, when he, was, mm -hmm. he, he went down to Silicon Graphics. Why? Because they made the computers that made the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. <laughs> We could understand dinosaurs. Computers, I don't get it, but dinosaurs, <laughs> I get. We had this familiar icon, and it was, it was getting way too complicated for everybody. And then we shifted onto the internet, and the ideas that became successful became ideas that anybody could understand. A bookstore for the web, Amazon.com. We all know bookstores, so easy. A yellow pages for the web, Yahoo. Email on the web, Hotmail. These became the, far, the most successful companies that grew like crazy. And around the world, people who were like, oh, Yellow Pages to the Web, I get that. They were showing up here on planes because they could get ideas like that. The Valley's population of women, though it's still a problem in these workplaces, has gone up significantly because a lot more women are not intimidated by these ideas. My, the ideas I saw yesterday, you know, a place to invite people to come to your parties. So a website that helps you manage invitations to parties. Well, who can't understand that? So, it, and you know, you go to this, these website screens, and the premise of a website screen is you should be able to figure out how to use it just by looking at it. No manuals, no help screens, whatever. And if you can't understand it just by looking at it, it'll not succeed. This is drawn vastly different kinds of people to Silicon Valley. When it was technological, it drew people just out of the engineering schools, and now it's drawing everybody. Mm -hmm. Tell me, you mentioned Amazon and, and buying books, bookstore on the web. You're involved as a publisher of Mercury House, is it? I'm on the board of a small press in San Francisco mm -hmm. called Mercury House. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Tell me about that. I mean, that's obviously something close to your heart. Um, the role of, say, Amazon in, in book selling and no, book publishing? No, I, I suppose, you know, whenever I think about small presses, I think about a lot of writers who are unable to get their books read by the general population or, yeah. or to get publicity for themselves and, and for good books, really, to be out there. And... Um, and also, you do talk a little bit about, in some of your writings, about the publishing industry in general and uh, how writers are sort of uh, bandied about uh, yeah. when it comes to it is publishing. A, it is a tough time. I, I, I got into book publishing in 1989 and have been involved since. My, my biggest role in it is that I am the chairman of the board of a company in St. Paul, Minnesota called Consortium Book Sales and Distribution. Mm -hmm. And for over 61 fine independent small press publishers around the country, we handle all of their distribution. So their sales, the shipping of the books, the collecting of the money, the marketing, and they kind of do the editorial and the printing. And so I'm very involved with you know small press publishing in that sense. And in that period of time, publishing has, has suffered greatly. And it used to be that an author wrote their book and the publisher said, we want to protect your precious author mind and your precious point of view. You write your book and we will take it from here and we will do everything else. And today, now, I've been, the, the pinnacle of it was what I had to do to promote this book. My publisher asked me to do this thing called the Silicon Valley Bleeding Edge Tour. So not only in today's author, you have to you know, write the book, you have to do your own copy editing, your own legal vetting, you've got to get yourself on Oprah, you've got to you know, tour around. And what I had to do was tour around, tour around two other authors that every night would critique my book and, and, and you know, tell me what they thought of it in, you know, in front of the cameras and that kind of thing, in front of crowds, and you know, criticize my work. And I was expected to criticize their work and defend ourselves and you know, create a huff and have a fight. Oh. You know? and, and I was like, oh, this was the bleeding edge tour? Nightly. And, oh. and then on daily, we're supposed to put these online di diary entries up on this website. And I have to, sub you know, as an author, I have to subject myself to like, defend myself constantly. Oh. And it was, in one hand, on some hand, it's sort of the ultimate humiliation for a writer. Like, this is what it's come to. Um, and 
I mean, I'm afraid as a small press publisher, I know how, how easy it is to, f to rise above the noise quickly and to just disappear forever. And on the other hand, I think some interesting things are happening. Be I talked before about the whole idea of selling out and that it was sort of taboo for a writer to be too aggressive with trying to, you know, get your name out there so people will buy your book because all you really want is to be able to keep writing books. I don't care how well they do, just someone tell me I can keep writing for the and rest of my life. knowing that people are reading, reading your work. Yeah. Getting something out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that that writers need to be more aggressive, or do you think that things may, well, may change should, or even out? And writers should do whatever they feel they need to do. And for the writers, I'm one who, because I have all the skills of publishing from my years, uh, I have a certain amount of savvy and willingness to stand up to what publishers are telling me and say, no, I know that that's not true. I know that that's not true. You're lying to me, and I know a lot more about that than you do. So they can't get away with things with me. But other authors, they get away with stuff all the time. Yes, and so small press publishing has not been the answer. It, it has been hard. We are able to pay authors three to $5,000 for a novel, and we'll sell three to 5,000 copies, maybe 10,000, occasional book 20,000 copies. Uh, we are not for profit. We barely survive. We're not able to devote marketing resources to, to these books. Uh, and then the big publishers are being gutted and scared of what's going on on the internet because Amazon.com knows who my readers are. They have their email and they have little customer profiles of my readers. Mm -hmm. Random House, my publisher, has no idea who my readers are. And, you know, I want to write books for people. If they've read one of my books, I'd like to be able to, maybe there'll be maybe five out of my next ten books I could sell them. And Amazon can help me with that. My publisher can't help me with that. Mm -hmm. They put books out, and they have no idea who's buying randomly. them. Randomly. <laughs> yeah, randomly, yeah. So it's a very scary time mm -hmm. to be a writer. And there is this feeling that it's almost like the Internet, like if you can get known now, because it's all going to come down soon. We're br publishing is, is broken, and it's going to fall apart soon. And you know, this sort of publishing Armageddon is about to happen, so you'd better get known now so you can survive then. You'll have a name that people recognize when we kind of have this Mad Max atmosphere of publishing. <laughs> and, and because people at Random House, you know, it's very hard to get people to do a really good job publishing books anymore. Publicizing also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's up to the author, I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's about that time that we can oh. open the audience um, up to asking questions for Poe. Um, please wait uh, for the microphone to get to you so that we can hear you. And I think this gentleman down here has a question. There was this idea that the internet was going to decentralize power and free people but that idea has been voiced before in the early days of radio, and it didn't happen. Instead, the big powers, uh, money or whatever, or the government manages to take over. Is this going to be liberation, or is it going to be the same takeover by the big powers? That is the question. <laughs> yeah, that is the question. That's the one. That's what I love. Is that, you know, I've written a book about Silicon Valley, and clearly all of the F Fortune 500 is looking at what's going on in Silicon Valley and emulating these new business practices. And I, no matter, no sooner can I be finished with my book that I can go back and retest the hypothesis. Can you still make it here if you just arrived from Taiwan like Ben did a few years ago? Um, that's why I was out yesterday meeting people who had just arrived. And I do believe I, mean, I think I'm ultimately an optimist about this. My fear is not that the internet is going to become the network next network television. And I look at the particular example of radio. Radio had a very limited amount of bandwidth from you know 88.5 to 106.7 kind of 88.1, and when when that was limited, it made sense sooner or later that some corporations came in and started to buy this up, buy this space up. And on the internet, bandwidth is unlimited. And my fear is more that we, we, we destroy 
whatsoever any idea of institution building. And I look at, say, what's going on in companies down in Silicon Valley that many of us would consider a startup. I mean, it's got 160 people or something. That's not very big. It's not even profitable yet. Uh, they've been only three or four years old. And half the employees are constantly checking their stock price versus how many their vesting schedule versus the housing prices to say, when do I have enough for my housing payment and I can quit and jump to a 10-person startup? or a 20-person startup, because that's where they feel like the action is. So people, they're not just jumping from Oracle. They're not just jumping from 30,000 employee companies. They're jumping from ones that are 100 employees down to ones that are 10. And that we are going to get to this point where, like authors, I'm exposed to the market. The publishers used to say, you don't have to be exposed to the market. We'll handle that for you. Now I'm exposed to the market. And that we will all be relentlessly exposed to the market constantly that we will have no great institutions, that they'll be constantly torn down as fast as we can sort of put them up. And that the rare commodity in that kind of atmosphere will be the downshift, will be moderation. I, I work as a freelancer, and I'm at this point right now where times are good and magazines are calling me and people want me to do things, and I, I'm afraid to turn them down. I'm afraid to shift back into second gear because I think this is my one chance. This is my one chance. And so everybody working as a freelancer, they, you become a freelancer because you want to slow down. You want to work for yourself. But you end up just going faster, faster, faster be, when you have those opportunities. And the, that will be the very rare thing, is how to have peace in life, how to have moderation. That's what I see happening. I look at, say, what's going on in Silicon Valley lately, and Internet stocks have come down 50% since April 9th at least across the board, and some new companies since then, 60, 70 percent. That may be the case, but the rate of entrepreneurship has gone up dramatically. The amount of venture capital going into new startups is looking to be at more than twice last year's record rate, and I see these startups being coming on the scene, just tens of them every day. And so, the fact that stocks are down isn't keeping people from saying, I want to get in on the small action. Um, that's my fear, is that we won't know how to live in moderation. We won't know how to slow down and have to spend time with our spouses or our children. Back there. <clears throat> Hi. Um, outside of your grandmother's critique of your work, <laughs> Was there another um, experience uh, that acted as a catalyst uh, to let you know that um, you were indeed in search for and may have arrived at finding your own voice as a writer, putting your soul on the page? Did something happen that you said, yes, this is it, I'm here? Um, I'm thinking through my mind as you're asking that question. I don't think it was points of feedback. I think it was hitting creative walls. There, I think it was about 1991, and I'd been writing, say, stories. I'd written a couple of books that I'd never read, never even read myself, let alone have someone else read. And I'd been writing stories for like four years. And I just hit a creative wall. I just thought, this isn't interesting anymore. And I turned to monologues and oral storytelling. And wow, that woke me up. Because I learned that when you take in information through your ears, I can start a story out and then shift gears and go into something else totally random, seemingly random, and then come back again, and we didn't forget. But you do it on the page, and it might be harder. So I began to, and the humor, and people would be, this stand-up performances, people would be really funny. So I started taking some performance classes and some uh, monologue, oral storytelling classes, and my writing got a lot better in that, at that period of time. You know, to, and I think it particularly it's been really helpful for me for writing about Silicon Valley, which can be such a technically complicated place. Not just the technology, but the business itself is extremely complicated and it's full of these terms that nobody can understand. And so what I would pay attention to to write about it is, you know, I'd go off and spend three days in the woods with salespeople or something 
learning all their lingo. And I would come back and I'd come down to the Edinburgh Castle and go see my friend, the bartender there. And he'd say, what have you been up to? And he doesn't know a thing about that world. And I would, I would pay attention to what would I say to him? And how would, I write a, how would I talk about it to him? What naturally came out of my word, my voice, talking to him? And that's what I should write about. And I was often writing about people and their stories. So those were those are sort of some of the one of the big factor was was letting the influence of these other arts come into what I was doing as a writer. I think there's a question way over there, Daphne. Uh, you talk about the 80s and materialism and Silicon Valley and all of that and, you know, the me generation and all of this. But um, do you see yourself, like, politically motivated? Do you see yourself growing, like, uh, uh, political awareness? Or do you see something like the Day of the Locusts with uh, Bill Gates replacing those Hollywood <laughs> figures? Um, tell me a little more about the, what you, the Day of the Locusts scenario. Well, uh, it's a, it's kind of like a satire on Hollywood and, right. and people pre preying upon each other. And do you see something like that? Because yeah. at this point, uh, the internet and all these people who are making big money from Yahoo and all of that is kind of like the 80s and 90s, money, 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 money. Right. But I don't see anything, anyone talking about other issues in the novel about homelessness. In, even in Silicon Valley, there's possibly poverty level there, there too. Right. Well. Is that a concern? Yeah. <laughs> Silicon Valley has, has not been prepared for the way it's been thrust into its role as a role model in our society. And essentially, it has to set an example for people. And I've watched this with myself as, as I go around Silicon Valley, people recognize me now, and they want to know what I think and what I have to say. And I feel a strong moral responsibility to exercise that voice. So. What I largely do is I follow startups, and I will tell them from the get-go, it's extremely important that you, know, you don't wait till the next generation of funding for your business to, to get your male-female employee ratio a lot better than it is now. It's very important that you start setting aside something like 1% or 2% of your revenue stream for what you're going to do with giving back to the community that you come from, that you are extremely lucky to live here at this place in this time. And uh, I do think that the Valley has not been prepared for the way it's being perceived. I think that it has a real, it doesn't even know, it's so claustrophobic down there that it doesn't know that people are making fun of it all around the country. <laughs> it does not know that. It does, they think it's great, they think everybody around there thinks they're great. Um, you know, the, you, to get someone to talk about the war in Yugoslavia in, in May was nearly impossible. And people, they would feel guilty about it, and they would say, you know, only be sleeping four or five hours a night and spend two hours a night watching CNN or MSNBC or something. But they couldn't, couldn't verbalize their thoughts. They felt choked. You know, you could literally try to talk to them about it, and there was great psychological dissonance going on, and they couldn't sort of exp couldn't put the two together. Like, how had they gotten so wrapped up in what they were doing that this was a problem? Um, so, I, I do think that that's a really important issue, and you know, I try to talk about the things that I'm that I'm doing, and you know, just like yesterday, I was doing the, this Jim Lehrer News Hour, and pictures say a thousand words. They just say so much. So it was really important when I was doing that story that I went down to this women's incubator and I found a lot of women that had just arrived here. Because I want those pictures out to people to know that you can come here as a woman and you can succeed and there are resources for you. Because we do have a problem, even in the, not just in the internet industry, but on the internet in general, about users. That, you know, that if you are African American in this country, you are half as likely to be on the internet if you are, as if you were white. And, these are, these are really serious issues that when it was a fringe element, you, know, you could sort of look away. But now that it's the whole country is watching, you can't be responsible about it anymore. I think the Valley is also kinder now to immigrants. I remember when we first moved here, um, my husband is an immigrant, and the doors weren't as open, opened as easily um, 
for immigrants as they are now. And I think that a lot of people who just have come here from far, from far lands um, have a better opportunity of making it. I guess in some ways money can be helpful in that aspect in, in helping uh, people not to be discriminated against because um, I know that sounds odd, but uh, you walk in and, and if you have a good idea in, in the valley, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. Um, the good idea is so sort of um, taken and, and, and can be and turn into something something else and it's, it's good for that person from that nationality or from a person of color can do that and it's, um, it, it's, it's actually been a good thing in some ways. Yeah. I want to uh, ask you a question um, getting back to what um, this gentleman asked you about um, and you were talking about family and spouses and not spending enough time. Um, because of this work ethic. And you'd written something uh, I read about how 100 years ago, families were pretty much on the homestead as pioneers when they came out here. They worked in the fields together and they, they went and they, had, and they had dinner together and their work was pretty much at home and their home was pretty much at work. And so there was a, a closeness between uh, family members, especially parents and children, that that we lost somehow during the times when you and I were growing up, and um, and you talk about how you, your father went to work and or my father went to work, and and we really didn't know what they did at work, um, and we saw them a few hours a day, and and this of course has intensified with the amount of work that the people do now, especially in the Valley and, and, and also in other, other places in our country. Um, what I found, and I, and I wondered if you would comment on this, is that we work so much, but now it's becoming um, a sort of thing where we work at home almost as much as we work at the office. And this boundary that, or this artificial boundary that we'd created during the 60s and 70s, um, 50s, and, and even the 40s, do, um, doesn't exist anymore. So the boundary is, is fuzzier. Right. And um, so I may spend more time with my child and my husband because we're all sort of have our own offices at home, and, uh, but we're working a great deal. And I guess my question to you is, do you, do you think this fuzziness that has developed between work and home is good for us? Yeah. Or do you, I often find it, I can't decide whether it's good for me or whether it's really a detriment. Well, I think compared to the creating a clean division between it, I think it is good for us, but it is dangerous. I, uh, two little anecdotes. Yesterday, I was raised this question with this woman entrepreneur, and she says, oh, it's great. You know, my, I have my husband vetting my business plans, and he's doing all this stuff, and I've got my parents surfing the web for me and doing all this prospecting on what my competitors are doing. And then, and then I was like, well, that's, that's great. You got everybody involved. And I got my kids, when they come home from school, they're surfing the web and they're like testing my site and finding code bugs. And I was like, she had, every, and they loved it as a family. And so I was like, I didn't know what to think about that. On one hand, they're putting everybody to work on this one thing. It was sort of like the farm. Everybody works on the farm. Right. On the other hand, <laughs> you know, they, they were just all doing this sort of internet-y thing and it seemed less balanced and less wholesome than physical manual labor or something. I, as a writer, uh, have really destroyed my life from working too hard at, on my writing. And so we have a place in San Francisco we call the Grotto, just it was a mm -hmm. nickname of a friend's place. Uh, currently nine writers are in this space. It is a cooperative working space. Um, we're lucky to sort of have found people that can kind of do this. And I go there in the morning and I come home in the evening and it's really helped draw a line where I do my work. Because otherwise I would be done dinner and I'd just turn that computer on and go back to write a little more. And by creating some line, establishing some principles, that's better for me. The good thing about blur the blurring is you got to be yourself and you're going to be yourself when you blur these borders. That's the story of the nudist on the late shift. The nudist was this urban legend I'd been hearing about. What I liked about it was, here's a guy who's, whose personal value system said, I'm clothing optional. 
So whatever, you know, you put whatever personal value system may be, but he says, I'm not going to stop being who I am when I come to work. And I think that's really important because the demoralizing part of work was, like I've talked about as a writer, not putting all of yourself on the page. The demoralizing aspect of work is when you're not entirely yourself and you can't really be yourself. And that's a problem. And to live in that state is just utter horror for me. And so whatever it takes, if it takes this blurring to allow people to say, well, this is who I am, we're going to deal with it. And we have more honesty in our lives as a result of that. I think that's worth some of the trade-off. We still have to learn how to draw lines about when and where we work. But it's, very, it's a really good thing that we've gotten rid of this idea that I'm going to be a different man at work than I am when I come home. It's a good message. Um, thank you. It's been yeah, a pleasure you. talking really to pleasure. you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Wow. Uh, Poe will be signing books outside um, at the table. With Stacy's. And, With Stacy's. Um, please remember to fill out your program evaluation forms, and thank you all for coming. Oh, thank you so much.